In today's lecture, we'll look at uh, vector active structures or uh, trusses or space frames. This uh, sort of mini byte will look at the uh, basic principles of uh, vector active structures, and we'll do a simple example to show uh, how they're different from but related to form active structures, uh, in particular uh, arches. We'll use this in the next uh, little byte uh, to look at a more complex truss and how forces flow within that. And then we'll finish up in the third byte with uh, some examples, looking at um, the use of vector active structures in uh, historic case studies and also in some uh, contemporary ones. So to begin with, um, <clears throat> we'll talk about how vector active structures uh, are like form active structures. They carry loads through axially loaded members, so compression uh, and tension. Um, but vector active structures are uh, arrange these elements into networks of what are called nodes and cords. So the nodes are where all of the pieces come together. The cords are the actual linear elements themselves that, that basically hold these nodes in place uh, and carry loads that are put onto the structure uh, through a, a network. Um, <clears throat> coming out to the abutments, in this case, uh, at, at, at either end. Notice a couple things. First and most importantly, the cords are all arranged in triangles. So vector active structures tend to have an overall triangular geometry. We know this is good. The triangle is the structural engineer's best friend because it's the simplest possible shape, uh, and it can't change its shape without bending uh, or deforming uh, some of the, the members within it. Uh, a square or a rectangle, remember since it has four joints, can become a parallelogram, right? can rack. Um, in a triangle, you're not relying on the stiffness of the joints to, to uh, keep the, the shape intact. You're relying instead on the overall geometry. This makes triangles uh, very efficient. Um, you can imagine that a network of triangles, two, three, five, a hundred triangles all working together uh, is going to have efficiencies of scale, efficiencies of synergy that are going to take those principles uh, of geometric stability uh, and, um, and, and multiply them uh, many, many times. When we take uh, vector active structures and uh, sort of combine them, hybridize them, make them work uh, at angles to one another, so in more than one direction, we get a particularly efficient type of structure called a space frame or a space truss. And this takes the already considerable efficiencies uh, of a two-dimensional vector active structure and it adds to them uh, this kind of multi-dimensionality, right? what we call hyperstatic behavior, where loads have uh, much, much greater opportunities to flow throughout a structure now in two directions uh, instead of just one. The basic principles, though, are all the same. And you can see in this space frame, if you look closely, all of the uh, linear elements are connected at nodes, and those nodes are fixed into a triangular geometry that then spreads throughout the, the entire structure. When we talked about form, uh, form active structures, we did a bit of basic form finding, and we went from the kind of simplest possible cable arch Remember, Robert Hooke says that we can take a, a, a loaded cable, we can flip it over, and we get an analogous structure in compression. Uh, notice that in a compression structure, we're worried about buckling, something that we'll cover uh, in future courses. So the compression structures are typically bigger, bulkier than the tension structures, but note that they have the same basic geometry, right? A, a triangle here, triangle there. If we add uh, two weights, we get a trapezoid, we load them unequally, we get an irregular trapezoid. And finally, if we add a, what's called a distributed load, uh, put the same weight at regular intervals along the arch, uh, we uh, come closer and closer to what's called a catenary shape, the, the shape of a hanging chain. And if we think about each of these, um, each of these weights being hung at every possible moment along the chain, we get this kind of perfect uh, funicular shape, this perfect catenary shape that serves us well as a, as a compression arch. The simplest possible arch is something that, that we'll go back to today to try to get to vector active structures. And if you think about it, the simplest possible arch would have two uh, voussoirs or two elements uh, and a pin connection at the top instead of a keystone. Uh, 
Remember that we talked about an arch working basically by transmitting the dead weight of one stone through an angled connection into the, the stone below. And as these, um, these joints between the stones kind of radiate from vertical to horizontal, we get resultants that gradually change angles uh, from somewhat horizontal to more vertical. So the taller the arch, the steeper the angle uh, that the arch comes into its abutment, the more vertical the resultant and therefore the less horizontal thrust we'll have to deal with. If we push down on this arch uh, really hard, we'll find that those bottom stones will still have a tendency to try to spread out, but it will take much less force to, to try to resist them. And the same will go for our, our very simple uh, sort of two member arch. We have a, a vertical load here. It's getting transmitted now along the, the, um, the length of those two members uh, into abutments on either side. And remember that the shallower the arch, the, the shallower the, the angle of the resultant, that kind of last little bit of, uh, of force that's being transmitted from the arch into its abutment. And for a very, very shallow resultant, we may have a horizontal force, uh, a, a thrust. In this case, we may need to resist uh, a horizontal thrust uh, that is much, much greater than the actual vertical load, right? So a shallow arch, we're worried in particular uh, about keeping it together, basically, about the abutment holding it, keeping it from thrusting out. And as that arch gets steeper and steeper, you can see that the resultant changes as well. So the resultant here, basically tangent to the last little bit uh, of the arch before it meets the, the support. And for a much, much steeper arch, you can see we have the same vertical component, right? We're carrying the same load, total load in each case. But as we get to a steeper arch, we have a much, much smaller horizontal thrust that we're trying to resist. And if we go to our kind of two piece arch, we can see again that uh, for a, a, a single point load at the middle, if we have a shallow uh, two-piece arch, we're going to have relatively high horizontal thrusts to take care of. If we make that much steeper, notice that the vertical components are exactly the same, but with the steeper arch, we have a much, much smaller horizontal component. We talked a little bit about how we could calculate uh, those support conditions. Uh, and using a little bit of trigonometry and using this idea that the, the, the resultant uh, force being transmitted from the arch into its support is kind of roughly tangent to the arch at, the, at its kind of last moment before it hits the, the abutment. Um, we can use that angle and we can use what we know about the vertical load. In this case, we have a distributed load, a W, on a symmetrical arch. We'll take half of that load and that will be the vertical component uh, of the resultant, right? So this is going to be one half of W. This is going to be one half of W. Uh, and what we'll find is that when we put those together, they will be equal and opposite to the load that we're putting on the arch to begin with. And therefore the arch won't go anywhere. It will be in equilibrium. If you want to be a, a, a physicist about it, F equals MA, we do not want acceleration. Uh, and so for any mass, we have to balance the forces, right? W minus two times one half W, the force is going to be zero. Therefore, the arch's acceleration is going to be zero. And here's our force triangle. Remember, we said that we can take all of the forces acting on a point. In this case, the thrust of the arch and the vertical and horizontal components of the reaction within the abutment. We can take those arrows and we can rearrange them head to tail. And if we can find a way to make a closed triangle, um, we can use the geometry of the arch, particularly the angle. Uh, and then one leg that we know about, in this case, the vertical load that the, the abutment has to support, we can then use trigonometry to find uh, the other legs of the triangle, basically. And here again, notice that uh, for a shallower arch, we have a shallower thrust that's being imparted into the supports. And therefore, even though the vertical component is going to be exactly the same, the triangular geometry tells us that the horizontal component in the shallower arch is going to be much, much greater. So we can take our simple arch and we can apply some of the same forces to it uh, that we would in, in a more complex arch. So we can put a load 
uh, onto it. For simplicity's sake, we'll say that there's just the load right at the, at the summit, at the, at the top point, the midpoint. Uh, we will have vertical reactions within the abutments, and we know that these two arrows, these two reactions, will have to be equal and opposite to the force that we're, or to the load, sorry, that we're putting onto the arch itself, right? So everything equals zero uh, in the vertical dimension. Notice that none of these have any horizontal component, but because of the geometry of our simple arch, we will end up with horizontal reactions in the support, right? The, the forces uh, that restrain the arch that keep it from spreading out. And these will be related to the angle of the arch and the vertical component uh, in, in both cases. Here, notice that these two have to be equal and opposite as well, right? We don't want the arch to accelerate in the left to right direction, uh, in addition to not wanting it to accelerate uh, vertically. So here we have all the kind of pieces uh, of an arch, and we can certainly calculate this. This is entirely form active. Every element uh, in the arch, all two of them, uh, are in compression. Uh, it's funicular in that we have one load and we have a very simple triangular geometry. If we were to uh, hang this as a cable to do some form finding, uh, we would get this shape just upside down. And we can fairly easily find the force in each member, as well as the horizontal and vertical components uh, of the reactions in the abutments or the supports using some, some simple trig. The arch is a fairly efficient uh, shape. Um, notice though that we've got those horizontal thrusts in addition to the vertical forces that we need to worry about uh, in the abutments. We talked a little bit about what happens if we add a tie at the base of the arch. In other words, instead of relying on the abutments to take care of those thrusts, what happens if we put a, a cable or something across the bottom so that the thrust on one side balances uh, the thrust on the other? We called this a tied arch, but we can also think of it as the world's simplest truss, a single triangular panel uh, a, a network of three elements that are all working together that are balancing stresses internally and that therefore impart no horizontal thrusts to the abutments. Uh, the only thing in this case that we're asking the supports to handle is the vertical load, right? Each support is going to handle uh, half of the load that, that we're putting on it. Now, notice that if we zoom way in, uh, each one of those elements is going to be a, a form active structure, right? These two are going to be in compression and we know just kind of thinking it through that the bottom element is going to have to be in tension. We have triangulated this. So uh, it is a single, uh, what we call a truss panel. Um, but because it is a triangle, uh, it can't change shape. It can't deform unless the members themselves deform. And now notice, too, that there is no horizontal thrust being imparted to the abutments. We have taken those reactions and we have basically moved them from the abutments into this lower cord, this tension cord. And we can um, think about this as either horizontal reactions that are being handled by that bottom cord, or since it's just one member and it has to be loaded the same uh, throughout, we can think of it as a third uh, stress. Remember, lowercase f is the, the letter we use when we're thinking about an internal stress within an element. And in this case, we can say that fb, the stress within that bottom cord, um, is, is going to replace those two reactions in the abutments. We can draw the arrows however, uh, however we want. If we don't know if it's compression or tension, we might draw them uh, pointing out. In this case, just to say that we know that that is going to be a tension number, I've drawn the, the arrowheads pointing in. Now, just like an arch, we can zoom in to one of these uh, abutments. We can think about what's happening at that point. We can draw a force triangle knowing uh, that these three forces exist and we'll all be working on that point. And we can use some simple trigonometry to figure out um, exactly what uh, the, the loads within those, or the forces, sorry, within those two elements uh, will actually be. If we throw some actual numbers at this, let's say we're putting a, a load of 1,500 pounds uh, onto our vector active structure. Um, all we need to know is the geometry. 
Uh, notice that at this point, we don't need to know the span of the truss. We would need to know that if we were designing a, a deck, say, that was, that was going to carry a load uh, across, the, across the, um, uh, the, the void here. But to figure out the reactions within the truss itself, at the moment, all we need to do is, is to know the geometry. So I've thrown uh, just some angles at this, a fairly simple truss, 30 degrees uh, uh, inclination for the, for the two legs. That gives us 120 uh, at the top. But all we'll really need to know is, is the 30 degrees. And knowing that angle and knowing in particular um, that each of these reactions are going to have to be equal and opposite to the 1,500 pounds, those two things will give us enough of a foothold to actually get in and, and figure out what FL, FR, and FB will have to be. So let's zoom into this uh, point right here um, and think about uh, what forces are acting on that point. We'll draw what's called a free body diagram, uh, thinking about that support just as a single point in space uh, and looking at the three forces uh, working on it in terms of vector geometry. And then we'll use some simple uh, triangulation and some simple trig to figure out uh, the, the magnitude of those forces, what they actually have to be. So here is the free body of that uh, support at the right-hand side of our truss. Uh, and we have three forces acting on it. We have FR, that is going to be the force within the, the top cord, the right-hand cord, thus the R. Um, we know that there's going to be a force, probably tension, in the bottom cord, B for bottom, F for internal stress. And then we know that there is going to be a reaction, that the, the ground or the, or the abutment is going to have to support half of the vertical load that, that we're putting on it. And again, with a symmetrical truss, we know that each of those two reactions is going to have to equal half of the total load that we're putting on it. Right? We just split it in half, divide it evenly among the two uh, symmetrical abutments. So that is what we call a free body diagram. We've drawn uh, vectors that show uh, what we think the direction is going to be uh, in each case. And if we rearrange those arrows uh, head to tail, and we can come up with uh, a triangle by adjusting the, the lengths of those arrows so that we get uh, a closed triangle, um, we, will, we know that that free body, that point where the, the, the truss hits the abutment, uh, will be in equilibrium, right? And, and that is the goal. So we can start with our 750 pounds. We know that that is the reaction in the abutment that's going to have to be pushing up, uh, resisting the, the weight that we're putting uh, on the truss. We know that we want to come back to zero. So we're going to have to find an arrow now that comes down. And then we're also then probably going to have to find an arrow that brings us back uh, to there. And notice that the, the way that FR and FB are arranged, we already kind of have that. So we can take FR and we can move it over. And notice that FR has to bring us down the full uh, 750 pounds of RR. We've got to come back down to horizontal because FB is horizontal, right? It has no vertical component at all. It's the horizontal uh, force in that bottom horizontal uh, accord in the truss. And so we can put FB there and say that, that those two will act at an angle of 30 degrees. Now, with these free body diagrams, remember that we're not talking about physical dimensions. Uh, if we were, then it would matter very much how we arrange the arrows. What we're talking about is forces that are acting on one point. And so we can arrange those at will and still get the same situation. In, in both of these diagrams, uh, the point is not moving at all. What we've done is we've just set ourselves up to find the set of forces with this geometry that will leave that point a stable in space, right, in, in equilibrium. Now, we can use two ways to figure out this triangle. We'll go through the trigonometry first, uh, and then I'll show you a, a shortcut using SketchUp, or you can use AutoCAD or, or any other 2D uh, drafting software to basically draw the triangle and figure out, uh, just for measurement, uh, what the, the legs of the triangle have to be. You can do that if you're sort of trig verse. Um, I think the trigonometry here is, is uh, kind of vaguely beautiful, so we'll go through th that and then we'll check it uh, using some simple drafting to, to see whether we've got the forces right or not. So first, uh, let's find FR. This will be the force in the top cord, actually the right-hand cord, uh, thus FR. 
And we will uh, do this using our, our simple trig. We have a right triangle, so we can use the simple trig formulas. Uh, sine of an angle in a triangle equals the opposite leg over the hypotenuse, opposite hypotenuse, since we know 30. Um, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent is opposite over adjacent. Now in our case, since we're finding force R, um, we'll start with what we know, which is the, the 30 degree angle. Uh, and we can come down here, and since we know the opposite, we're trying to find the hypotenuse, we're going to come down here and we're going to use the sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of 30 equals uh, opposite 750 pounds over hypotenuse, uh, FR. We can do some simple algebra. We can take uh, the FR, uh, we can divide both sides, sorry, or multiply both sides by FR. So if we do that, what we end up with is FR times sine of 30. And over here, if we multiply that by FR, FR just goes away and we get 750 pounds. Now we can either go to the charts or we can use our calculators and find that sine 30 is in fact very simple. It is 0.5. And so 0.5 of FR has to equal 750. Now we're going to multiply both sides by or divide both sides, sorry, by 0.5 uh, to, uh, to sort of move it to the other side and get a, a clean FR. And what we get is FR equals 750 pounds divided by 0.5, or really 750 pounds times two. And we find that FR actually equals 1,500 pounds. Note that that is equal in magnitude to the load that we're putting onto the truss. Um, <clears throat> We get that because uh, of the of the 0.5. We're um, dividing half of the magnitude of the load uh, by 0.5, so we're we're coming up with 1,500 pounds. But notice that it is not in the same direction, right? So that 1,500 pounds that we're putting onto the the uh, top of the truss is getting divided into two top cords. They are both going to share that uh, that force. It, they'll be equal in magnitude, but not equal in direction. We can also use trig to find FB, the, the force that's in the bottom or, or, or tension cord. And here notice that if we know 30 degrees, we have opposite, and this time we're gonna be finding the adjacent. So we'll come down here and we'll use tangent of theta equals opposite over adjacent. In this case, that will be tangent of 30 equals opposite, 750 pounds, divided by adjacent, uh, FB, the force in the bottom cord, or the stress in the bottom cord, force in the bottom cord, sorry. Um, we can uh, multiply both sides by FB. So we get uh, FB times tan 30 equals 750 pounds. Tangent of 30 is 0.577. So uh, here now we have FB times 0.577 equals 750. And we'll do the same algebraic uh, process up here. We'll try to get a clean FB. And to do that, we'll divide both sides by 0.577. So FB is going to equal 750 divided by 0.577. And if we run that on our calculators, we find that FB is going to be 1,300 pounds. So 1,300 pounds of tension, 1,500 pounds of compression, 750 pounds of, uh, of force in the abutment itself. Now, if you're uh, not down with uh, the trigonometry or if you just want to check uh, your work, you can go to any drafting program. Uh, we'll go to SketchUp and you can uh, do some very simple drafting to see whether basically you've got it right. I would recommend doing this in metric, not in imperial. Um, because we want kind of clean units. We'll do it in meters in this case, but we'll just try to remember that a meter in our case is a, is a pound, right? We're not actually drawing something that's in physical space. We're drawing vector representations. So we know that the vertical leg of the triangle again is 750 pounds. So we can come over here and we can draw uh, a vertical line that is 750 units. Um, it'll say meters. We know that it's in pounds. We know also that that top cord is at a 30 degree angle, so we can draw our protractor here. Uh, we can come over and we can make the angle be um, 30 degrees. Let's try that again. 
And now we can use our measuring tool to simply measure the legs of the triangle. So here is our uh, vertical reaction. That is 750 units, 750 pounds. Uh, here on the bottom, this is the, the tension force within that bottom cord. And you can see that that is close enough, right? 1,300 uh, pounds. And then finally, the compression force in the top cord is going to be this leg. And that, as you can see, is 1,500 pounds. So a simple way either to do the calculations, uh, if you don't want to do the trig and the algebra, uh, or to, to, to check your work. And you're welcome to do either one of those uh, for, for, the, for the labs. So here is basically what we get. We've added now the, the numbers uh, that we got from our uh, equations to the, the triangle itself or to the truss itself. Here is the, the load that we're putting onto the truss. Here are the two reactions. Notice that they are both one half of the total load. These were the vertical legs of our triangles. We looked at that point and we found that to resolve that 750 pounds uh, of a vertical reaction, given the angle of that leg, we needed a force, a compression force within the top cord that was equal to 1,500 pounds and a tension force in the bottom cord equal to 1,300 pounds. So we have now solved the truss, admittedly the world's simplest truss. We'll get into some more complex ones later. Um, but what we found is we found the kind of uh, balance of internal stresses within these three form active members that when we pin them together, produce a, a, a kind of self-balanced structural element that is only imparting uh, vertical forces to the abutments on either side. And therefore, we have successfully spanned whatever this dimension is uh, by simply using triangular geometry. Now, how would this work in practice? Well, typically, when we design a, a truss, we're designing a, a deck that we're going to put something heavy on. Um, let's say in this case, it's a, it's a big train. Now, we would have to design the deck in this case as a, a, a section active element, a, a bending element, a girder or a beam spanning the entire dimension of the, the, the void here. What we can do if we turn this into a truss, we can add a, a simple vertical hanger here, and we can basically divide the span in half. And we can now use the truss to carry the load of that locomotive uh, by putting a P not into the deck itself, but in this case, into that node at the top, right? So here, this is gonna be a, a tension element, uh, a hanger. It's gonna take the load of the locomotive and put it right into the vector active network that is then going to carry that load or half of that load out to the abutments and balance that resultant with the tension force uh, that's in the deck itself. So, uh, a, a fairly simple vector active truss. Uh, hopefully this has explained some of the basic principles. We'll do a slightly more complex example in the next uh, little bite. And then in the third bite, again, we'll look at some case studies to see how these principles have actually been put uh, out into the world to solve uh, structural problems.